Welcome to Heartbeat Alaska. I'm Gary Fife in Tionic, Alaska. Love three quarter. CEO of uh, Tyonic Native Corporation. Let me introduce the president, uh, Ted Croto. Oh. Ted. And we also have with us the president of the Native Village of Tyonic. He's hiding here someplace. There he is. Come on up, Peter. <laughs> Peter Merriman, Merriman is the. Uh, and it's not married man, it's merry man, it's a happy man, uh, is the president of the Native Village Council. And uh, this project is being done uh, jointly with them and the Alaska Science and Technology Foundation. Uh, the primary uh, focus for us is to build a bridge across the Chewitna River and the uh, Long Creek uh, Bridge. Those bridges will uh, uh, help us develop uh, the area of infrastructure for many developments, including timber, coal, and uh, as time goes on, you'll see other projects come through here. Um, and uh, at this point in time, uh, with that introduction, I I'd like to again thank Jamie for this opportunity for Tynic Native Corporation to work cooperatively with them. This is not only a timber uh, treatment plant, it's also a bridge plant, it's also a stepping stone to future development for uh, rural communities. We would very much like to see these kinds of projects, not only uh, here at Tyronek, but uh, there ought to be a project like this in southeast Alaska, on the Yukon River, on the Pescaquim River, and uh, in the Atna region as well. And we're looking forward to working with those areas to develop this. Uh, let me again reintroduce uh, Bart, and Bart will uh, uh, take us through the, uh, the program. Uh, how do you do? I'm uh, Chief Operating Officer and General Counsel for Tynic Native Corporation and President of Alaska Wood Products. Uh, this has been a project that's been a long time in coming, uh, first uh, imagined by Tom and then uh, brought to uh, fruition by the board of Tynic Native Corporation and now with the uh, assistance of the Alaska Science and Technology Foundation. We started building this building in October of 1995 and it took a couple months, two, three months to complete it. Uh, finished in midwinter. Uh, in the springtime, we started uh, work on the interior of the building, the fabrication lines. And this was in the midst also of putting together a, a five year business plan back in the corporate offices for the development of a timber treatment facility. Uh, that plan and presentation was made this Alaska Science and Technology Foundation in February of 1996 and uh, we made that uh, presentation in Juneau, uh, looked at uh, some of the different case scenarios and uh, wanted to bring to the state the first commercial scale uh, double diffusion uh, treated wood uh, facility in the state to uh, put together uh, timber uh, bridges and other types of materials that would uh, be best uh, uh, used in uh, or fabricated from uh, treated wood, such as railroad ties. There are other products as well that we're looking at, uh, as well as uh, untreated products to make use of uh, a lot of the wood that comes out of the, out of the uh, timber that we have to cut for large scale timbers that you'll see here very soon. The fabrication line was finally completed, or at least the initial um, basic line was completed about June of this year and we've put through the first batches of timber in the last couple of weeks that you'll be seeing today. Uh, we have five people employed on the fabrication line right now, another person employed uh, in the offices and in the plant to keep track of the materials. One of the main purposes of the uh, 
project here in the first couple of years is to figure out the cost of these goods so that we can see whether we're uh, really in the ballpark in terms of the market, what we anticipated that market to be. So we'll be doing uh, statewide marketing studies for treated wood to determine who the competitors are, what the competitive prices are of replacement materials, and uh, see if what we imagined was going to be a good idea and is going to work out. And that's where ASTF has been very helpful and supportive in helping finance that uh, feasibility study, as well as to uh, help with uh, some equipment that will make the plant more efficient in the next uh, few years. Um, we anticipate uh, that we will know those answers in, a, in two to two and a half years, and quite frankly, should know before that time. Um, so far, we've seen uh, potential markets coming at us at, at, at rapid speed, people coming at us faster, quite frankly, than and we can really produce products at this point in time. Quite interested in, in a treated wood facility that can create these bridges and other products uh, in state at what appears to be uh, competitive prices. Um, but also, not just the prices. Um, these are products um, that are inherently uh, more efficient and, uh, and better at the applied uses. Uh, for some purposes, a timber treated bridge is superior to a steel bridge um, for engineering purposes for uh, uh, for particular uses. So um, it's not just the price and the, and the replacement cost of the product, but also the product itself. So um, in the next couple of years, you're going to be seeing us improve the uh, fabrication lines, improve the fabrication system, uh, determine the full scope of the markets, and see if we can't get the products online in a timely and uh, profitable basis. Uh, we also all need to uh, have a word from uh, Jamie, but before we do that, um, no project like this goes off without a, uh, someone coming up with the idea, with the heart, with the drive to make it happen. And um, uh, I don't want to mislead you that uh, Tyonic has thought this up. We were very fortunate to have been aware of another ASTF project, funded project, which was uh, developed at the University of Alaska. And the developer of this program is a fellow new, by the name of uh, Dr. Kevin Curtis. He's rather shy, so we'll don't let him speak after me. Don't don't scare <laughs> him. Uh, but he's the fellow in the shades over there on the far end. And he hasn't shaved yet this morning. But, uh, <laughs> Great, Jimmy. Yeah, let me just say a couple things. Uh, the mission of the Science and Tech Foundation is to enhance the development and application of science and technology for the direct benefit of Alaskans. And this project is going to prove out, it's a good test of our mission. And it, we're out to prove three things. The first is that good science can be turned into technology. Kevin will speak next uh, be, about that. But we essentially funded many years ago the work to prove up the double diffusion process and deploy that in the first bridge and in Goldstream Creek in Fairbanks. That's the first thing that uh, we need to prove, and I think Kevin should be cr given credit both for good science and for the work that he did with a fair amount of uh, work from us as helping you to find the customer for that science. So we're continually engaged with the university community about what good science is and finding a market for that science. The second thing we're out to prove is that we can manufacture final products in Alaska. We're not going to increase the wealth of the state unless we expand imports, expand exports, or, or, uh, or, or, sub, or build things that substitute for products that we're currently importing. And I expect that this uh, facility is going to take a, a, a add to the wealth of the state by being able to have the jobs here and build products that are competitively priced for materials that we're currently importing at greater cost. And the third thing is that this is a good project. And what I mean by a good project is that we're sharing the risk of this. Both ASTF and Tionic are putting money in, and we're both uh, happy to be out there sharing those risks together. And frankly, neither of us would take those risks alone. Now, the second thing is, and Bart was a little humble about this, is that there was a fair amount of work on the early business plan that will be firmed up in the next few years, but we went through a significant amount of 
spreadsheets and works that JP did with Bart about what this market looks like. And so we're going to we're going to define that. We've got a good pre-feasibility business plan and it's going to be turned into a whole business plan in the course of this project. So as we do the technology, we're also going to be doing further commercialization work. And, and I think the most important uh, thing is the people involved. Uh, I've been frankly uh, very heartened and, and comfortable to work with Tom, Bart, and Kevin uh, last year. And, uh, and I, I don't want to uh, forget the most important piece about the credibility and straightforwardness of the people you work with to put projects together that make sense. Uh, Kevin, you want to say? All yours. Um, I, I guess uh, I, I'd like to start with just a little bit uh, about why these projects started. Um, I'm a, a structural engineer by training, and I came to Alaska in 1989 to, to teach at the university, and the first thing that I found was that all of the dimension lumber that was being used to build all of the significant facilities in this state was being imported. It was being shipped in. The worst case I saw, and, and it's not by way of blaming anybody, but was I, I was out in McGrath and I saw five herkloads of dimension lumber, Canadian spruce pine fir, being flown into McGrath, which if any of you have been out there is in the middle of the woods. Um, so the, the whole point has always been Let's see what we can do with our own native species. Uh, there, there's no reason in the world that this tree is better in Canada than it is here. So that, that's been the underlying goal of all of the work at the university. Uh, and ASTF was, was extremely supportive of that. Uh, their whole goal, was, as Jamie said, was to try to, to uh, come up with some import substitution. And there's no reason we can't do that with our native species. We started out. Uh, fairly ambitiously trying to do mechanical properties testing with Alaskan white spruce so that we know how strong it is so that we can design with it. Uh, a parallel effort at that time was, was this double diffusion process. This is a process that the, the U.S. Forest Service put a lot of development effort into early. Um, it does not have the huge uh, hundreds of thousands of board feet throughput that the lower 48 pressure treaters want. Uh, so it, it, it hasn't caught on in the mainstream lower 48 market yet, but the British are looking at double diffusion treating. The Australians and New Zealand uh, all doing research in, in double diffusion treating. So this isn't a process that I created or that, that Alaska created. This has been in development for quite some time. What we wanted to do was prove that it would work effectively with uh, Alaskan white spruce. So in conjunction with the mechanical properties testing, we started doing development work with double diffusion treating Alaskan white spruce. And there's, there's nothing like a structure to prove to the public that it's not just numbers, that it wasn't just another university project. And so we built an experimental uh, bridge in the Tanana Valley State for, uh, Forest with the Department of, uh, or Division of Forestry uh, in November of 1994. And part of what you'll see inside is a, a, a little presentation on that project. And it, it shows you where we're moving with this, this project. Because the reason Tom got in touch with me was Tionic would like to do some infrastructure development over here. The cost of imported steel and concrete bridges are just prohibitive on this side of the inlet. And so projects that look good, it's, it's a good development project, can be killed by the, the cost of developing the infrastructure to support it. When, when we build the, the Chewitna Bridge and the Lone Creek Bridge, the materials in those bridges will be probably 80% Alaskan species from near where we're standing. Rather than importing the concrete and steel, we'll be constructing those bridges primarily out of materials that are native to uh, Alaska and harvested by local people on these lands right now. Um, so that, that's the, the background of the double diffusion treating system. Just very briefly, technically, the, the double diffusion treating system is an immersion, an atmospheric immersion process. You successively immerse the, the, treated, the, the wood to be treated in two baths of treating chemicals that when they combine inside the wood matrix, uh, combine to form an insoluble compound. We, we dissolve them both in water, we let them flow into the wood, a chemical reaction takes place inside the wood that precipitates out an insoluble compound. And that's why the wood stays preservatively treated. Uh, we looked for a long time at what the right combination of treating chemicals were. 
Uh, most of the treated wood, the pressure treated wood that you see uh, in Anchorage, for instance, has been treated with a chromated copper arsenate. Uh, obviously, the components of that, uh, that treatment process are chromium, copper, and arsenic. Both chromium and arsenic are very effective biocides, and that's why they're being used to preserve the wood. But humans have a relatively low tolerance for those chemicals. Humans have a fairly high tolerance for copper. So a good choice for a preservative chemical is one that includes copper. That left us with trying to cover the range of biocide that was covered by the chromium and, and the arsenic in the uh, pressure-treated wood. And what we came up with was sodium fluoride. Uh, this sodium fluoride is the same material that they fluoridate the city water with in Anchorage. Uh, it's in lesser concentrations, obviously, than what we're treating with. I wouldn't go drink the, the fluid in the tanks. But it is the same material that comes out of your tap. We have a high tolerance for fluoride, so it's a good biocide for choice for wood preservation. And, and that was why we're using a combination of uh, copper sulfate and sodium fluoride. When those chemicals combine in the wood matrix, they form a precipitate, copper fluoride, that's insoluble in water. And that means that it stays inside the wood, which is what gives its, its continued uh, uh, wood preservation effect. I guess uh, with that, do you want to take a tour? Yeah. <laughs> I have my own uh, company. I'm acting as a consultant uh, on this project. Actually, it doesn't change the wood at all. It, it goes in and, and the decay fungi need four things. They need uh, oxygen, they need water, they need a, a satisfactory temperature, and they need food. We can't really do much about the air or the water or the temperature. What we can do is poison the food. So we, make the, we deposit chemicals in the wood that poison the food for the decay fungi. How long does this last, so to speak, or have you figured that out? Um, there's a, a stake bed up near Palmer, near the experimental farm, that had, was, was put in 32 years ago. Uh, the double diffusion treated material, it was treated with slightly different chemicals. It was sodium arsenate instead of sodium fluoride. But that material's been 32 years in service with no decay. And when you go up there, it looks like it just came out of the tanks. Um, I don't, I, I'm uncomfortable projecting and extrapolating data like that to, because we are using slightly different chemicals, but I think that a, a 40 to 50 year lifetime is very reasonable. Uh, before they this log uh, on the, the mill right now came from right up at the top of the block. Um, and it's important with the double that it's as green as possible. So we've designed this plant so that we can do uh, planks for you to show you the kind of wood that, that we've been getting out. You may want uh, to use ear protection uh, if you grabbed any off of the uh, table out there. And there's more ear protection in the box hanging on the wall over here uh, if anybody still wants them.
to Anchorage and, and go to some place where they're they're selling in, imported spruce pine fir or uh, even even the second growth Doug fir and compare it to the quality of the lumber that we're cutting here in Alaska. Yeah, there are 26,000 acres uh, in the original reservation that are currently forested. So uh, there's not a lack of supply. Uh, it's it's starting to grow, and that's another reason for us. Uh, anxious to get this program underway. As you heard, uh, this needs a live tree to be uh, viable. It, it has to have a live tree to be treated. Um, a spruce bark beetle killed tree is not alive. You can't can, treat it. Is there anything you can do to it? Uh, just yeah. It was going in the redecking on the uh, on the Yukon River Bridge on the Dalton Highway, and the answer is that's all imported, uh, pressure treated wood. And it's one of the reasons why we need to be here. And then the second part of the question was, why is, is wood so prevalent in, in uh, the bridges that are going up the Dalton? And the answer is, is that we have problems with, with extremely low temperatures. And steel at 60 below, they had a problem when they were building the Alcan that they were dumping pipe off the back of the truck at 60 below, and it shatters. Concrete has the same problem. It gets very brittle at low temperatures. So. Wood is very forgiving of low temperatures, an ideal use for transportation structures in Alaska. Uh, it takes a pounding at low temperatures and behaves as well or better than it does at, at warm temperatures, and that's certainly not true of steel and concrete. What we're doing is we, we want to get that wood into the tanks as quickly as possible. We've set up, we, we will be setting up an assembly line across the back of the building. There's an access way that's been cut into the wall over there. ASTF's funding is going to be used to take this from pretty much a custom build type of operation to a full manufacturing operation. What we're concentrating on with their funding is going to the next stage of production so that we can come up with marketable commercial packages uh, and have a high enough production rate to do it. Um, that <coughs> saw is capable of about 3,400 board feet a day. Our plant right now is designed to run about 850 board feet a day. And with the ASTF funding, we hope to expand that to 1,700 to 2,000 board feet a day. Uh, we can run 2,000 board feet through each tank each day uh, at, at uh, our optimum. And we've got the potential to add more tanks as we get new products. Uh, the, the flow of the material then is uh, wood comes off of the sawmill. With ASTF funding, there'll be a series of drill presses and saws along the back wall that will completely drill and cut to length all of the bridge material. We want it all treated, and we don't want to do any cutting or drilling after the material's been treated. So we don't expose any wood to decay. It, every cut surface is, is treated in this process. Um, we use the forklifts that are outside to move that material over here and, and band and bundle it. Um, we're stand, uh, this is a, a, an example of material that's been banded for the tanks. Uh, and is ready to obviously be lifted into the tanks. We're using plastic strapping because uh, the copper sulfate is corrosive to steel. It's a, it's a, a banding material that's been specifically designed as the wood shrinks, the banding shrinks with it and keeps it tight. That's how we're going to control warping. The material, after it comes, it is banded and bundled, will be immersed in using, we have a number of variations on the process, and this is part of what the ASTF funding is helping us to do, will be immersed for a period from 24 to 48 hours in the sodium fluoride tank. It's raised, allowed to drip dry, rinsed, lowered into the copper sulfate tank, where it'll stay for, uh, again, a period of, of 24 to 48 hours, depending on what process we're using. Uh, the variations on the process are straight atmospheric ambient temperature, uh, we have the ability to do thermal enhancement, which heats the liquid in the tank and increases the uptake so we get a little higher retention level. And our third that we're looking for ASTF to help us develop is ultrasonic enhancement of this process, where we use big ultrasonic arrays to drive the chemical through the wood, and we literally can cause flow of the treating chemicals through the wood with the ultrasonics. Um, so we'll get a very high retention level. After the wood comes out of the second tank, it's brought up and wrapped with this plastic. 
This material and this bundle will be going into the Kepler-Bradley Lakes Bridge in uh, early October of this year. This material is already pre-drilled for the post-tensioning rods and is ready to go into the bridge system now. And we're negotiating with the Mapsu Borough uh, for the purchase of this bridge. Um, after, after the material comes out of the tank, one of the things we found at the university is it's very important to keep it wet for another month. Now that's why the plastic wrapping. And then, after that month out of the tanks, we'll take off the plastic wrapping, we'll allow it to air dry. The material will remain banded all the way to the site. That's why we've banded the 4x4s in here, so we can get a forklift under all this material. Um, and so it'll stay banded until it gets onto the construction site and we break the banding. That's pretty much it in a nutshell uh, as far as the operation.